This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our survey of the Old Testament looking at the book of Leviticus. Now before we continue, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we're allowing the Holy Spirit to control us. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity and the privilege, everything you provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look at the purpose. We briefly look at the purposes and a phrase or two, and then we'll look in more detail. The purpose of the book of Leviticus. <clears throat> One, to provide a manual on holiness. Two, to instruct the people on worship. Three, to instruct the Hebrew community in holy living so they might imitate God's holiness. For so that they can, it could enjoy the presence and the blessing of God. Major themes, again, we look at the headings. We'll come back to these themes in more detail. Holiness, sacrifice, Sabbath rest, and sabbatical year. Now you may think that the survey of Leviticus might be difficult because of all the laws well, it does have its challenges. I will not kid you on that, <clears throat> but I think you'll find that it's worthwhile. One of the points I want us to see here that I really didn't want to put under either one of the previous two points is a link to God's presence. Here's what I mean by that. I'm just going to put it on the board. Leviticus attests to God's presence with his people in the sacrificial system. The laws of purity establish a standard of holiness to maintain the covenant relationship, and the legislation ensures reverence for his sanctuary in their midst. That is, God's presence, holy presence in their midst. This all contributed to God maintaining his presence and walk with his people. So what we should see here, even with this brief summary of themes and purposes, is that this is a book that centers on keeping the people close to God. We use the term presence or walk. Let's look at the outline. Outline is valuable here in that it gives us an overview of where this book goes, what's going on in the book. Though we just read through these, you get an idea of the framework, the structure of the book. Approaching a holy God, then you have laws about sacrifice, the burnt, that should be burnt, burnt offering. The grain, the peace, the sin, the guilt, instructions for priests. Then laws about the consecration of priests, rules about the priest, anointing Aaron as sons, Aaron's sacrifice, the death of Nab, Dab, and Abihu. Then we get into the second major section living in the presence of a holy God. Laws about clean and unthinkable. Clean things includes food, childbirth, leprosy, and skin diseases, discharges, and secretions. Laws about holiness, the Day of Atonement, taboo on eating and drinking blood, laws about sexuality, civil and ceremonial laws, various laws and punishments, laws for priests, feast and calendar. Then we get into covenant blessings and curses. Then finally, what we might call an appendix, 
on laws about vows and gifts. The vows and gifts would sometimes go together. So Leviticus is a manual. It's like you might say they have to refer to the manual to see how to handle this. Leviticus is a manual of priestly regulations and duties, as well as a handbook of instructions prescribing practical, holy living for the Israelite covenant community. If you want to maintain your closeness with God to stay within the covenant and experience his blessing, follow the regulations in the book of Leviticus. The English title actually comes from a Greek word. Let me get it up here for you. From the Septuagint again. Let's see if I can get some more space here for it. I'm just setting up for some of these things as I go along here. I had forgotten about this one in particular. Luatikon. That's from the Greek Septuagint again, meaning pertaining to Levites. That's where we get our English title. So you get a reference to that. The Hebrew title, well, as we have learned, that comes from the first few words in the Hebrew book of Leviticus. And this basically means, and he called. The far right letter that's sort of a, looks like a, maybe some form of an L is actually a conjunction. And they read it right to left, and it basically says, and he called. Now you don't see the points, that is the dots and double dots in the Hebrew text because they didn't have it. But this is how we get it in the uh, lexicon, their dictionary type thing that we often use. Again, the author is not mentioned, though the phrase, the Lord said to Moses, comes more than 25 times in the text. Orthodox and Christian scholars have traditionally attributed the book to Moses. The dating, again, dates back to when was the Exodus. We discussed that in previous lessons. Uh, 1400 or 1200 are the two most popular dates by scholars. I go with the 1400 date, the early date, as they call it. Some background. Moses received this information from the Lord when the Lord was speaking to him at the tent of the meeting. We see that in 1.1. He's still at Mount Sinai. And this was during Israel's 11th month at Mount Sinai after the Exodus. So they've been there for some time. And he receives this message at Mount Sinai, Exodus 19.1.40.17. Let's talk about some cultural background for a moment. We talked about the importance of that in a couple of previous lessons. We need to understand, except the fact that other nations besides the Hebrews practice ritual purification and animal sacrifices. Sophisticated priestly classes were in charge of their sanctuaries and temples. In fact, that was known practically through all the religious traditions that went on at the time of the Hebrews. When they received their instructions and in faith, other nations and people had their temples, their sanctuaries, their priests, their sacrifices, their rituals. Ceremonial washings and purification rites were common. Um, they claimed to do this before their gods in both Mesopotamian and Egyptian religion. Uh, sacrifice, both animal and human, were common as well. 
The Canaanite religion included peace offerings, whole or burnt offerings, similar to those Hebrew practices. Just remember this. One of the reasons that Joshua, Joshua was to go in and conquer these people when they went to the land and wipe them out is because they had these false religions. And these false religions practiced many of the same procedures that the Hebrews are going to learn to practice with their own. Uh, however, there's some major differences. With all these things in common with the Hebrews, there are several distinctions. Let me give you some of them here. I'll use a bullet point system this time. Here's the exceptions. This is what the Hebrews did that the other nations didn't. They're actually theophany and direct divine revelation. They actually got this from God to Moses to the people. There was a strict monotheism. They believed in one God. They worshipped one God. There was also the teaching and understanding of the origin and impact of human sin. High moral and ethical nature of the Hebrews in contrast to the fertility cult of the Canaanites. Another one, the holy and righteous character of Yahweh in contrast to the changeable behavior of the pagan deities. And then the prohibition of human sacrifice. So you don't have any of these things on this list that were in common with the pagan religions of that day. All right, now let's get into some more detail about the purpose, the message. I'll put all this up here at once. <clears throat> the central teaching of the book is in this phrase, consecrate yourself to be holy because I am holy. Leviticus 11 44 and 45. That was a central purpose. The people were to be holy in their lives. That extended into their worship, into so many details of their lives, and the way they do their sacrifices, their cleansing, presenting themselves before God. Break it down by a couple of Sections of the chapters, 1 through 10, procedures for worshiping Yahweh. 11 through 27, how the covenant people of God are to translate this holiness into daily life. And this is all towards enjoying the presence and blessing of God. Leviticus 26, 1 through 13. And transforming the people into a holy nation. Exodus 19.6 So these rules and regulations had their purposes to benefit the people by being in the presence and receiving the blessing from God and transforming the people into the holy nation they were to be. On the one hand, when you begin to realize this was the purpose for them to be holy people, and they lived in a world that was basically unholy, you say, well, no wonder they had so many laws and regulations in so many areas of their lives. That's right. You wonder why there's not a lot more. But at the same time, you think, well, that's a lot of rules and regulations. So you have this kind of mental conflict going on. Why so many rules and regulations? Because they lived in a world where if they're going to stay separate in all these different areas of their lives, they needed guidance. Let's talk about the structure and organization of the book. How do we go through the book? What's the flow of the book? The book begins where Exodus left off. Moses is at the tent of the meeting still, and God is addressing him with prescriptions about worship and service that were to take place at the tabernacle. If you recall, at the end of Exodus, the tabernacle had just been built and was dedicated with the entrance of the glory of the Lord coming in. Another thing 
The first word in the Hebrew text, you may recall this when I was talking about the title, is the conjunction and. So basically, you leave off Exodus with an incomplete sentence, and then you have the word and at the beginning of Leviticus, connecting the last word to back to the last word in Exodus. So it is to be read as continuous instruction. And then again, we see these phrases like the Lord said to Moses. And then later you'll say, and Moses did as the Lord commanded. So we see this continuous combination of phrases. Uh, the Lord said to Moses and Moses did what the Lord commanded. For example, in Exodus 31, 1, 33, 1, and many more. Exodus 40, 16. In the Leviticus 8.13, and many more. So what we're to see here, there's a continuation of instruction coming right off of uh, the book of uh, Exodus. Leviticus also shows its unity with the larger Pentateuch. We see the common historical background between the books of Exodus and Leviticus. We also see the divine oracle formulas the Lord said to Moses. There are also other opening and closing formulas like this is the law and other phrases like I am the Lord your God. All these point to the unity of the law within the Pentateuch. So what we're saying is lots of literary evidence to show that Leviticus is part, Leviticus is part of the Pentateuch. It's a continuation of Exodus. Again, the legislation in Leviticus follows the construction and dedication of the temple at the end of Exodus. It starts out giving the purpose of the sacrifices in chapters 1 through 7. Then the requirement for priesthood for Aaron and his sons in chapter 8 through 10. Then the rest of the book regulates the lives of the people so they can live in holiness as his people in their daily lives. There's cleanliness regarding foods, childbirth, infectious skin diseases, various impurities that hinder worship and community relations. That takes us from 11, chapter 11 to verse to chapter 15. Chapter 16 addresses the day of atonement. Then after that, there's more guidelines for holy living. Eating of blood is forbidden. Unlawful sexual relations. Standards of honesty, idolatry. That goes from 17, chapter 17 through 20. Verse 21 picks up with regulations for priests and offerings and feast. 21 through 24, 9. At 24.10, punishments for blasphemy and murder. Takes us through verse 23 of chapter 24. Chapter 25 is the regulations for the Sabbath and year of Jubilee. 26 is the blessings and curses. The final chapter concerns offerings vowed before the Lord and the solemnity of their nature. These last two chapters, that is chapters 26 and 27, strengthen the covenantal context of the regulations. Kind of closes the back door, you might say. Let me read to you from Leviticus 26, 45 and 46. A summary and purpose of the regulations, this set of verses seems to sum it up well. This gives you an idea of what's going on in this book. But I will for their sake remember the covenant with their forefathers whom I brought out of the land of Egypt, this would be the Lord speaking, in the sight of the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. 
These are the statutes and rules and laws that the Lord made between himself and the people of Israel through Moses on Mount Sinai. Well, that sums it up beautifully. These are now going to be God's covenant people. He brought them out of Egypt for this purpose. For all the nations, he's going to be their God. He states, I am the Lord. That's the word Yahweh. And then he gives the statutes and rules that they are to follow. Now let's talk about the major themes in detail. The first major theme is holiness. Holiness. When you think about Leviticus, you should think about holiness. Holiness comes from a word that means separation. It includes the idea of not being among what is common and mundane so what one can serve so one can serve and worship god holiness also refers to god who is holy apart from creation as the creator let me give you an idea of what this is saying by sketching it perhaps the best way to do this is just sort of View this as the world. A world with sin. A world with people who are sinners. And then we have a holy God. God will not, cannot, does not have the relationship with sin that people have. So how does this person have a relationship with God who is holy? That is the issue. God is holy. He maintains his separateness from sin. What God has done is given man a set of regulations let's do it this way by which if he lives within these regulations let's put man over here he can live a holy life in a unholy world However you want to picture it, that's the idea. If the people were to separate themselves to God, they had to live lives that indicated that. This was done through obeying the covenant stipulations and regulations. So in a real sense, the covenant keeper separates himself to God as God is already separated. So he has this experience and connection to God as he lives a holy life. Now this is really quite remarkable when you look at it. What God has given his people. A way to maintain at the same time his presence with them. To experience God. To live in blessing. Because of this holiness connection with God. If the people constantly follow these rules and regulations, they will show themselves to be living the holy life before God and their service and worship. And their lives before God, following these rules and regulation, listen to this now, were service and worship. They dealt with their sin. They lived by faith. They obeyed God. That shouldn't sound new to us, should it, Christians? 
Let's look at some verses. I'm going to put this down at the bottom. Leviticus 11.44. I used this as a main reference earlier. Um, so let me get it on there. Leviticus 11.44a, For I am the Lord your God. Concentrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I am holy. God demanded holiness. He wanted his people holy. For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy for I am holy. They were truly a special people. All in God's plan all on God's timing, and for them to enjoy it and appreciate it, they had to live holy. As far as today goes, just a quick comment on that. I don't think many Christians understand what it means to be holy. I think many are raised in religious settings that teaches them to be religious, but not holy. And they equate it with the same thing. Religion is done in human strength. God has given us today, Christians, the Holy Spirit, so we can live holy by depending on Him. They didn't have that option like we do today. They didn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit. It was a matter of discipline, and also staying under God's blessing. It's a different setup. We have a better setup now. But it could be done in the Old Testament up to the point. But also remember, the law demonstrated to them they couldn't do it on their own. So as hard as they tried, it was impossible to live the holy life. Demonstrating they needed God's constant provision. So... That's why they had the sacrificial system. And then when Christ came, he was a final sacrifice. It did away with the sacrificial system, getting us into our day and time where we recognize Jesus as the single and final sacrifice. It's over with. And now we live our holy lives by still confessing but we don't do the sacrifices because it's been done and still living by faith. Relating to worship in the book itself, chapters 1 through 10, give the proper procedure for approaching the Holy One in worship. Chapters 11 through 27 shows how those in covenant with God translates the idea of Yahweh's holiness into the sphere of daily living. So again, it's, it's about holiness. That is one of the main themes. It's about holiness. Let's go to some other scriptures where I want you to see the basic purpose of Leviticus was also to give instruction to the community in both holy worship and holy living so they might enjoy the covenant blessings. This is a long reading. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its seasons and the ground will yield its crops and the trees their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest and the grape harvest will continue until planting. And you will eat all the food you want and live in safety in your land. I will grant peace in the land and you will lie down and no one will make you afraid. I will remove your wild beasts from the land, and the sword will not pass through your country. You will pursue your enemies, and they will fall by the sword before you. 
Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you. I will look on you with favor and make your fruitful, make you fruitful, increase your numbers, and I will keep my covenant with you. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you will have to move it out to make room for the new. Now listen to this one. I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God who, will, who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with your heads held high. Now what you have just read, let's start with the end of this. God brought these people who were in slavery for 400 years. Bring them to a point where they could have a relationship with the God who did that for them. Knowing that God had delivered them from this oppression of the Egyptians. God takes them to where they can now have a relationship and experience God. And they could experience his blessing if they followed his decrees and commandments. Did you pick up on all of that? They'll have good seasons, good crops, peace, prosperity. If they have to fight an enemy, they'll always win. Five of you will chase a hundred. They will intimidate their enemies. The enemies will fall by the sword. The population would increase. They'd have so much food that they wouldn't have room for the recent crop. But even then, he says, I will put my dwelling place among you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. How could it get any better than that? What a deal. And it's remarkable that the vast majority rejected it, that very generation. Why? They did not live by faith. God is looking for people who will live by faith. Who will live the obedient life. Now you may have heard me teach other subjects. I think in particular of Luke. And maybe even some of the basics where I talked about count the cost. It's more than worth it. It's more than worth it, far more than worth it to live your life before God, holy, obedient, trusting in Him. I'm afraid that so many have been inculcated with religion that they've missed out what exactly that means. You can't do it without learning the word regularly without pouring your heart out before God in confession when you sin, depending upon the Holy Spirit, so you can walk in fellowship with Him daily. And He's there with you. So we see the continued blessing for Israel if they obey God in following the covenant It was a constant activity for the people of Israel to be concerned about what was holy and what was unclean. This encompassed the physical, moral, and spiritual realm. So we look back at our little chart here. It was everything around them. The physical, the spiritual, 
the moral realm. Let me throw in some things here. Uh, you have sin out here. You have pagans and their religions. When I say sin, you have all the temptations of the pagans, fertility cults. You want to go worship their gods? Well, you can go to their temple and grab one of their prostitutes. Trying to follow the moral laws in a society that was immoral. To be spiritual with God when everything was unspiritual. Now, folks, it's no different today. No different today. I might even add today, you have devil plus. That means it's more intense than ever before. It's his last period of time to really come out while we have this phase of human history to cause as much damage as he can to God's people and God's plan. The people of Israel were to maintain their distinctions. They were to maintain their distinctions. The law, the law showed them how to keep these distinctions. In other words, if they were going to keep this covenant relationship, if they were going to stay locked on to God in a world that was basically stained with sin, this was the natural world, by the way, they could live holy lives within this world and at the same time be blessed by God. Now listen, under the law, Let's talk about the law now. How, how, how do they do this? Let me, I wrote the word regulations. Let me write in here the law. Under the law, everything in life was either holy or common. Let me show you how this worked. These things that were common were subdivided into clean and unclean. Let's look at this little chart. Those things that were common were subdivided into clean and unclean. Clean things might become holy through sanctification. So you have a clean thing here. If it was going to be Holy had to be sanctified. Or they could become unclean. That would be going this direction by being polluted. That makes them unclean. That be polluted makes them unclean. Unclean things could be cleansed and then consecrated or sanctified and eventually become holy. So they had to go this path from unclean, to cleansed, making them clean, sanctified, to over to holy, you see. Common or unclean things could become devoted to God through both human and divine activity, but they had to go through the process that involved the sanctification process and the Lord would be the sanctifier. It seems like it's a little complicated. It's like those things, though, that once you learn them, you learn how to do it. It's not so hard. You've done it before. You have to go through the routine. Uncleanness may be um, uh, may come about by disease or contamination, infection or sin. It could be cleansed only by ritual washing and sacrifice. This is why the instructions regarding sacrifices were important. If you're going to do a sacrifice through the washing and sacrifice system, you had to do it right. Right. 
Remember that the Holy God was present among the people within the tabernacle. Hence the importance to keep things clean. If you're going to do it, you're in the tabernacle. You have to follow the procedure. Listen to Leviticus 7.21. Let me get you a new sheet here. I'll just put it up on top. Leviticus 21. Correction there, Leviticus 7, 20 and 21. I don't know why I said that wrong the first time. But if anyone who is unclean eats any meat of the fellowship offering belonging to the Lord, they must be cut off from the people. Anyone who touches something unclean, whether human uncleanness or an unclean animal or any unclean creature that moves along the ground and then eats any of the meat of the fellowship offering belonging to the Lord must be cut off from the people. Now, I use this first because it shows you that failure to comply could bring death. Remember, God was present with the people. If you're going to respect that, you have to follow the rules. Otherwise, you don't get in, and if you try to break in without following the rules, it can cost you your life. So people were to realize how important it was to follow the rules and live holy. When it came to coming to the presence of God at the tabernacle, you must follow the rules, or it could cost you dearly. Remember, the holy God was present among the people within the tabernacle. If he was going to maintain his stay there, you had to follow the rules because he wasn't going to put up with any of this sin stuff. I think the remarkable thing is that God even allowed them to come there in the first place. But he set it up so if you do this, follow this a certain way, go through your cleansing, do your sacrifice a certain way, make sure the priests are qualified and doing what they're supposed to do, you can come into my presence and appreciate and worship me. You see. Let's glance over to the New Testament. How does this work into the New Testament today? Under the New Covenant, we are all considered unclean at birth because of inherited sin. Because of the fall of Adam. We learned that in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 14. So we're born unclean as unbelievers. We must be washed and sanctified through justification. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Talking about being unclean and that, that is what some of you were but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And then where do we go from there? Now that we're cleaned, we're sanctified by justification, faith in Christ, we are to live holy lives, 1 Peter 1.16. Yield to the Spirit of God in obedience to the power of the Spirit, Romans 6, 15 through 23, 8, 13 through 14. Now back to our major theme. Our next major theme is the sacrifice. The sacrifice. This is one of those lessons, again, you might want to listen to a few times to try to get an idea of what it's really saying. Ritual sacrifice was one way the Israelite could gain access to God. Now, there are other ways. Prayer, seeking, like in Jeremiah 29, 12 through 13. Coming, coming humbly with contriteness in spirit, Isaiah 66, 2. 
But ritual sacrifice was one of the ways that Israelite could gain access to God. You want to get near God, experience his presence there in the tabernacle. Now, again, keep it in mind, other peoples and nations also did their own animal and grain and drink offerings. That was to placate their gods. The Israelite God was different in that it was divinely revealed how they were supposed to do this, and the goal was holiness. <clears throat> now let's get an overview of this. There were five types of sacrifice or offerings. as part of formal, corporate, and personal worship. There was a cereal or grain offering, the fellowship or peace offering, the whole burnt offering, the sin offering, and the guilt or trespass offering. Now these are further divided into two categories. There are those offered spontaneously to God in praise, here, let me just put that on the board for you. It might be easier to... So you have these five. I'll put all of this up there for you. I'll just read it through with you. So you have these five divided into categories. One, those offered spontaneously to God in praise and thanksgiving for blessings received or favors granted. So God gives you a blessing. You're going to go give him a sacrifice or some sort of offering and thanksgiving. This includes the cereal or grain offering and three types of peace offering. There's your scriptures, Leviticus 2, 1 through 16, 3, 1 through 17. These are in response to God's goodness. And then there was a set of sacrifices, number two, those demanded by Yahweh on the occasion of sin in the community. If you sinned, you had to do these sacrifices, okay? This includes the burnt, sin, and trespass or burnt offerings. There's your verses, Leviticus 1, 3 through 17, and 4, 1 through 6, 7. A lot of them there. These were necessary, listen to this, for purifying from the desecration of sin. This restored the penitent sinner to fellowship with other persons and God. The penitent sinner is one who has to do something to get right with God. All right? So that's just, it's just not repentance. But there's something additional one has to do, and this would be it. You had to follow this procedure. And there's rules to follow, and there's reasons. We'll get to those later. Why do they do this? So understand there were some offerings that were spontaneous in response to God's favors, but there are also offering that were demanded by Yahweh because of sin in the community. Let's talk about some other principles that come up as you read through these Levitical uh, passages. The principle of the blood. Let's talk about the blood. Life is represented in the blood. 1711. Principle of the blood. Life is represented in the blood. For the life of a creature, this is from Leviticus 1711, for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. So, blood upon the altar was necessary for the symbolic cleansing of God's presence and forgiveness. God wanted to see that blood. Hebrews 9, 21 through 22. This is why you had to have the animal die and get his blood. A life had to pay for sin. Folks, that's the lesson. A life had to pay for sin. The blood was the symbol. This is how atonement was made on the altar. <clears throat> 
Now let's talk about atonement for a moment. We've talked about atonement in a number of other teachings. The word for atonement, the verb, uh, form to atone, kafir, kafir. This refers to the purging of a holy object from the effects of sin. Now, here's the idea. The altar would be purged on behalf of the offerer whose sin had ritually tarnished it. So the blood would purge it. They would clean it. It was cleaned with the blood, you might say. It was, um, what's the word we use today? Sanitized, that type of thing. The purpose was to maintain the sanctity of God's presence in their midst. This also opened the way for the offerer's reconciliation with God. So, the blood took care of the sin. Allowing them to maintain God's presence among them. Another point, point of salvation. Let's talk about salvation and sacrifices. Sacrifices were never intended to save people. They preserve the holiness of God's presence and a good relationship between God and the people. Did you hear that? Let me put that one up on the board for you. Sacrifices were never intended to save people. They preserve the holiness of God's presence and a good relationship between God and the people. Under the Old Covenant, righteousness came through faith in Yahweh. Remember that. They were still safe through faith, Genesis 15, 6. They maintained their uh, faithfulness. They maintained through faithfulness to the covenant and its stipulations. So, righteousness came from faith. They maintained that faith, acting out their faithfulness in the covenant through following its stipulations. It's similar to just saying live the obedient life. In other words, living by faith. Habakkuk 2.4, compare that with Romans 1.17. That's Habakkuk 2.4, compare with Romans 1.17. Also, Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38. Then I'd suggest to see John 3.36, if you're not familiar with that, about faith and obedience. The external act of sacrifice was both symbolic and a reflection from the internal heart. The external act of sacrifice was both symbolic and a reflection from the internal heart. Obedience from God is what he wanted, not sacrifice. If you're familiar with those scriptures, 1 Samuel 15, 22 through 23, Proverbs 21, 3. Let me state the principle again. Obedience from God is what he wanted, not sacrifice. Let's go to Psalm 51, 6, 16 and 17. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. In other words, it's not the ritual. It's the fact that what's going on in your spirit You see, the sacrifices portrayed what was going on in your heart. That was what was supposed to be going on. It's no different today. What we do for God should reflect from our heart, whether it be giving, serving, praying, helping others should come from the heart. 
God granted forgiveness to anyone manifesting a broken and contrite heart. That is, sincere repentance. Guilt was removed and forgiveness of sins were granted through confession, petition, and prayer to merciful God. Exodus 32, 11 and 12. Also compare that to Isaiah 6, 5 through 7. This maintained God's presence and was worship. Now the sacrifices, I've mentioned this many times, taught things to the Old Testament saints. It taught them forgiveness, mercy. Uh, taught them about human sinfulness, substitutionary death, the need for personal response through repentance and confession. The sacrifices themselves illustrated redemption. They learned the laying, they learned about laying down of a life. Then we come to the New Testament. The New Testament taught that Christ was the once and for all sacrifice for the sins of humanity. Romans 5, 6 to 11, Hebrews 10, 12. When you look at the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews connects the Day of Atonement to the death of Christ with the offering of his body. That's in Hebrews chapters 9 and 10. Compare that with Leviticus 16. What about the New Testament? New Testament sacrifices. The Bible tells us that we are now believer priests, that the sacrifice was done for sin. Now what do we do regarding our service today? New Covenant or New Testament sacrifices. This, again, is not new if you've seen this in other studies with me. I'll put these on the board. The New Covenant believer priest first offers himself as a living and holy sacrifice, Romans 12, 1, Philippians 2, 17, 2 Timothy 4, 6, Revelation 6, 9. Another way of offering as a believer priest to generous and cheerful giving, Philippians 4, 18. Three, worship and praise. Ephesians 3, uh, excuse me, Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. Prayer, Revelation 5, 8 and 6, 9. Evangelism, Romans 15, 16 through 17. Sabbath rest and sabbatical year. The major religious festivals of Israel were arranged according to the agricultural calendar in Palestine, so the Israelites would acknowledge God as the provider and sustainer. Leviticus 23, 4 through 44. The command to observe the Sabbath one day in seven prefaced this calendar. Leviticus 23, 1 through 3. Let's talk about the Sabbath. I'll have one more comment here. Remember the calendar was according to the agricultural uh, cycle with the seasons. Let's talk about the Sabbath. The Sabbath reminded Israel that Yahweh was the creator, Exodus 28 through 11. This brought some sense of holiness to time. God gave time, we learned that in Genesis. And he also gave time to set aside a day as a reminder that God brought both time and that he had a time set aside for him, holiness. It was to be a time of rest and recovery so that when one started out that well, today would say Monday morning. The other six days were that of work 
both for man and animal. Remember, animals rested during the Sabbath. And enjoying one's labor. Ecclesiastes 2, 24 through 25, 5, 18 through 20. The Sabbath was also a covenant sign, a covenant sign between Yahweh and Israel. And that Israel's holiness was connected with the Holy One, Yahweh. Exodus 31, 12 through 17, Leviticus 26, 2. So the Sabbath was a covenant sign as well as a holy time to be set aside for rest and recovery. Under the New Testament, by the time of Jesus, the legalism of Judaism had so obscured the Sabbath that it was hardly recognizable, except to keep a set of extreme rules, ridiculous rules in many cases. Matthew 12, 1 through 4, Mark 7, 1 through 13. That speaks of the incident of Jesus and his disciples eating from grain on the, sub, on the Sabbath. Talk about the Sabbath year. Sabbath year was about the land. This occurred every seventh year when the land was to lie fallow and to allow the land to recover from six years of crop usage, the sowing, the cultivating, and harvesting. We see this in Leviticus 25, 1-7. It was during this Sabbath year where the land was fallow that the poor could go out, the disadvantaged could go out into that fallow land and get what crops there were some that perhaps weren't harvested, some that grew up. Anyway, they were to go out there to the land and glean what they could, Exodus 23, 11. So it helped the poor. It benefited the disadvantaged. The laws in Deuteronomy expanded to include, during this year, the cancellation of debts, which also provided a generous relief for the poor. There was also relief for the poor, and the release of Hebrew slaves, those who had put themselves under slavery, perhaps to pay off a debt. Deuteronomy 15, 2 through 18. So every seven years, the land would lie fallow. All the Hebrew slaves would be freed, and there would be an extra amount of food for the poor. Let's talk about the Jubilee year. Every 50th year, they could call it the year of Jubilee or the year of emancipation, Leviticus 25, 8 through 24. So what you have here after seven sabbatical year cycles, all right, six years, the seventh is a sabbatical year for the land. Go another six years, then you come up to that seventh year again. After you went through seven of those cycles, you came to the 50th year. Here the land was sanctified in the 50th year. All property would revert back to the original owners. So during that 50-year period, if you're a good businessman and you had uh, made good deals for yourself and you actually got the property of others because they had to sell it to you to pay off their debt. At the end of that 50 years, at the 50th year, you'd have to return it to them. That was all in the deal, too, by the way. Let's say it was the 48th year when you ended up taking their land. Well, you knew you are going to have to return it in two years. So you'd only pay, what, you know, two years worth of using that land to be worth. Let's draw some conclusions from these Sabbath ordinances. These Sabbath ordinances fostered social and economic well-being as well as equality. It taught important covenant principles in Hebrew society, such as thanksgiving for God's provision, faith in His continuous sustenance, forgiveness in the remission of debts, respect of persons, made in the image of God. We saw this in the release of slaves. You didn't keep slaves in per perpetuity. Generosity and promoted good stewardship over the land and its periodical redistribution going back to the original owners.
This gave a real balance to society. It also showed dependence upon God. You know, one could not accumulate uh, people's land and hold it forever. They had to give it back. So there was this system by which it made the people respect others. Yes, they can come and work for you, but only for the time until it's time to release them. You may get their land, but you're going to have to give it back. Because you see, there's limits. It limited greed. It made people respect others. It even had provisions for helping the poor. Those who couldn't do well. Those who just had no business sense. Those who couldn't make much money. And they kept making bad decisions. God took care of them. Because he had this system that provided for them. That was the Sabbath. Where everyone recognizes. You made a lot of money during that period. That's because God provided it. And let's give it back and someone else is going to get a chance. You see. Interesting enough. It was the neglect of these Sabbath laws. That led to the great discipline that came to the southern kingdom with the Babylonian exile. If you study Daniel, you're very familiar with that. Jeremiah 25, 8 through 14, 2 Chronicles 36, 17 through 21. Again, Jeremiah 25, 8 through 14, 2 Chronicles 36, 17 through 21. They, uh, those scriptures show that their discipline came from their neglect of the Sabbath. The neglect of the Sabbath cycles led to the neglect of many of the principles that came with these Sabbath rests. And God in his justice would punish the people to exile, quote, into the land enjoyed its Sabbath rest, end quote. Second Chronicles 36.21 compared with Leviticus 18.28. Well, that covers the book of Leviticus. Let's pray. Oh, Father, this has been a real study load today. Uh, thank you for the tremendous challenge. Help us understand holiness. That we too are to live holy lives. And you have given us, at the same time, the benefits of doing so. And the means. Challenges with these things we've heard today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.